After all the meat was dry, the six bands of our nation that had come together about the time when the great vision came to me broke camp at the mouth of Willow Creek and scattered in all directions. A small part of our band, the Ogolalas, started south for the soldier's town on Smoky Earth River, Dwight. For some of our relatives were there, and we wanted to see them and have a feast of Aguapi and Pizuda Sapa with Chahumpi Ska in it. All the rest of the Ogolalas stayed in the country with Crazy Horse, who would have nothing to do with the Weishu. Wasichus. This was late in the moon when cherries are ripe, July. And we boys had a good time playing. There were not many boys in our small band, and we all played together. I had quit thinking about my vision. The queer feeling had left me, and I was not bashful anymore. But whenever a thunderstorm was coming, I felt happy, as though somebody were coming to visit me. We camped first on Powder River, and then on the headwaters of the North Fork of Good River, Cheyenne, where there is a big butt, butte, that we called Sits With Young One, because it has a little butte beside it. Then we camped on Driftwood Creek, then on the Plain of Pine Trees, and next on Plum Creek. When we got there, the plums were turning red, but they were not quite quite ripe yet. My grandfather went out and got some big red ones, and they tasted good. When we got to Warbonnet Creek, which was not very far from the soldier's town, my aunt and other relatives were there waiting for us with bread and coffee. We had a big feast. I was sick all that night, and the next day my parents made me ride on a pony drag, because they were afraid I would surely die this time. But I think it is only too much bread and coffee, and maybe the plums. We camped again at Hips Hill, and by this time most of our people from the soldier's town were among us. The next day about twenty teepees of us went on, and the rest stayed back. We camped with our relatives by White Butte near the soldier's town, and stayed there all winter. We had a good time sliding down with sleds, sliding downhill with sleds made out of bison jaws and ribs tied together with rawhide. I was ten years old that winter. And that was the first time I ever saw a Wasichu. At first I thought they all looked sick, and I was afraid they might just begin to fight us any time. But I got used to them. That winter one of our boys climbed the flagpole and chopped it off near the top. This almost made bad trouble for the soldiers surrounded us with their guns, but Red Cloud, who was living there, stood right in the middle without a weapon and made speeches to the Wasichus and to us. He said the boy who did it must be punished, and he told the ways to choose it was foolish for men to want to shoot grown people because their little boys did foolish things in play, and he asked them if they ever did foolish things for fun when they were boys. So nothing happened after all. Red Cloud was a great chief, and he was a Nogalala. But at this time, he was through with fighting. After the treaty he made with the Wasichus five years before, 1868, he never fought again, and he was living with his band, the Bad Faces, at the soldier's town. Crazy Horse was an Ogalala, too, and I think he was the greatest chief of all. In the moon of the red grass appearing, April, about thirty teepees of us broke camps and started for the Black Hills to cut teepee poles. We followed down Horsehead Cutting Creek to its mouth, and while we were camped there one day, I was away from the village alone when I heard a spotted eagle whistle. I looked up, and there he was, hovering over me. The queer feeling came back very strong, and for a little while it seemed that I was in the world of my vision again. But there we moved on to Buffalo Gap at the foot of the hills, and my father and I went out alone to look for deer. We climbed out up through the timber to the top of, of a big hill, and it was hard for my father, who was lame from the wound he got in the Battle of the Hundred Slain. When we were on top, my father looked down and said, There are some yonder. You stay here, and I will go around to them. Then the queer feeling came back, and I said without knowing why I said it, No, father, stay here, for they are bringing them to us. He looked hard at me and said, Who is bringing them? I could not answer, and after he had looked hard at me again, he said, All right, son, 
So we lay down there in the grass and waited. They did come to us, and my father got two of them. While we were butchering and I was eating some liver, I felt sorry that we had killed these animals, and I thought that we ought to do something in return. So I said, Father, should we not offer one of these to the wild things? He looked hard at me again for a while. Then he placed one of the deer with its head to the east, and, facing west, he raised his hand and cried, Hey, hey four times and prayed like this. Grandfather, the great spirit, behold me. To all the wild things that eat flesh, this I have offered that my people may live and the children grow with plenty. That was another happy summer, for the big trouble had not come yet. We cut plenty of teepee poles up along the creeks that came down the east side of the Black Hills. There was all we wanted to eat. The hills were like a big food pack for our people. Iron Bill, Iron Bull, a little boy my age, and I had great fun fishing. We always made an offering of bait to the fish, saying, You who are down in the water with wings of red, I offer you this, so come hither. Then, when we caught the first fish, we would put it on a forked stick and kiss it. If we did not do this, we were sure the others would know and stay away. <coughs> if we caught a little fish, we would kiss it and throw it back, so that it would not go and frighten the bigger fish. I don't know whether all this helped or not, but we always got plenty of fish, and our parents were proud of us. We tried to catch as many as we could so that people would think much of us. There was a nam, man by the name of Watanye, Watanye, who was good at spearing fish, and he had very sore lips so that he did not dare to laugh. Were all They were cracked all around his mouth. People would try to make him laugh, but he would just walk away from them. One day he said to me, Little well, brother, I will show you how to spear fish. So he went up the creek, and there was a fish this long to his elbow, lying in a pool. Take the spear, Watania said, strike deep. They are always farther than they look. I took the spear and thrust it, thrust with it as hard as I could, but the clear water was much deeper than it seemed. I missed and went over first into the head first into the cold pool. When I scrambled out, Watanye was all doubled up, hugging his belly and going, ha, ha, ha. Blood was running down my chin. He ran away as fast as he could, and for a long while after that, whenever he saw me coming, he would turn and run so that he would not have to laugh again. Once I hid in a bush until he came along, just to see him run when I jumped out. I think Watanye liked me a good deal, because he often used to take me out alone to fish or hunt, he was always teaching me things. Also, he liked to tell me stories, mostly funny ones when he did not have sore lips. I still remember one story he told me about a young Lakota called High Horse, and what a hard time he had getting the girl he wanted. Watanye said the story happened just as he told it. Maybe it did. If it did not, it could have, just as well as not. I will tell you that story now.